Okay, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Um, welcome to the garden. Um, a few housekeeping items. We will not be taking questions during the conversation, um, but do type your questions into the Q&A and my friend and co-host Lorena will be hosting a question and answer session at the end of the conversation. Um, my guest today is an artist who I've admired for many years. Her large scale ceramic installations convey the beauty and fragility of our planet's coral reefs. Translating scientific research on coral bleaching into works that are as visually stunning as they are heartrending. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I've prepared a small, um, a short uh, presentation so I can share her work with you. So Courtney Madison creates intricately, intricately detailed and large scale ceramic sculptural works inspired by the fragile beauty of coral reefs and the human caused threats they face. Through her work, she raises awareness for the protection of our blue planet, urging policymakers and the public to conserve our changing seas. Madison has been commissioned by, to create work for permanent collections, including those of the US Department of State's Office of Art and Embassies, Lindblad Expedition's National Geographic Endurance Ship, as well as for private patrons. Her work has been exhibited at prominent venues, including the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art, the American Museum of Ceramic Art, the US Department of Commerce headquarters, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In 2020, the United, the United Nations Postal Administration included Madison's work on a postage stamp to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Born in 1985 and raised in San Francisco, Madison received an interdisciplinary Bachelor of Arts degree in marine ecology and, sculpt and ceramic sculpture from Skidmore College in 2008, and a Master of Arts degree in environmental studies from Brown University with thesis credits at the Rhode Island School of Design in 2011. Her work has been featured by international outlets, including Smithsonian Magazine, Good Morning America, Oprah Magazine, CNN Indonesia, BBC World Service and Science Magazine. She lives and works in Los Angeles. And for artists like myself who are grappling with the planetary crisis, Courtney Madison is a role model and an inspiration. She epitomizes for me what can happen when science, art and advocacy come together into something bigger than the sum of their parts. She is bringing attention to something so critical, translating both her love and her grief into works that speak to audiences on an emotional level. My own climate awakening came when I realized I may never dive into a vibrant coral reef with my six-year-old son. Courtney's works capture both that deep love of the ocean and the loss I felt when I saw firsthand coral bleaching turning once lush coral reefs into skeletal dead zones. I am so thrilled and grateful that Courtney is here with us today. Hi, Courtney. Welcome again to the garden. <laughs> Hi, Claire. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor. Thank you. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Could you tell me a bit about your childhood and what awakened your love of the ocean? Sure. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, I grew up in San Francisco and I loved exploring the coast as a kid. I was fortunate to have a lot of time to kind of poke my head into little tide pools along the California coast. And then I also was able to visit Hawaii a lot as a child because my father had a job that brought him there pretty frequently. So um, coral reefs really captivated my imagination from the very beginning. And when I had the opportunity to start studying them in high school as a 17 year old, um, I jumped at that opportunity and I also began sculpting around that same time. So I've been sculpting ceramic corals for decades now and um, it's really kind of a weird eccentric combination of interests that has snowballed into something that I'm having a lot of fun doing as a career. Yes, it's amazing. You really are right at the intersection and making such gorgeous work. I didn't realize you started 
the ceramics so early. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, I get, this kind of ties into the next question, um, that you have such an interesting and truly multidisciplinary academic background. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit more about your studies and how science and art became intertwined? I think I really discovered it um, in college when I was studying both art and marine biology at Skidmore College. Um, I felt like combining art and science had a power that was really greater than the sum of its parts because art can translate concepts from science in emotionally and personally impactful ways that I think can really influence how we understand our relationship with the natural environment in a way that makes us care. Um, and data often don't do that on their own. And so I felt like I could use my voice as an artist to kind of translate the science of climate change into art. And um, it's always an experiment. I think there's just so much power there um, that it's really worth trying to harness in different ways. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting the things that you're saying have come up again and again in the books and articles that I'm reading about climate change and really coming from people in climate advocacy and climate policy saying, you know, art has a power that our reports don't. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I, you're, that's I, one of the many reasons why I think your art is just so critical and so important at this point in time. Thank you. Um, and again, kind of dovetail dovetailing from that, could you tell me a little bit more specifically about your master's thesis? Um, how did your research findings influence your art and also your views on how to best engage audiences on ocean protection? Yeah, so uh, after I kind of discovered that intersection of art and science and kind of dabbled with that power to inspire people um, to become excited about ocean conservation issues through art, I decided I needed to go to graduate school to really do something big with that idea. And I knew I wanted to create a masterpiece, but I had no idea what that meant. And so I went to Brown University um, in Rhode Island and studied, uh, I did a master's in um, environmental studies, but half of my coursework and one of my thesis advisors was at the Rhode Island School of Design, which is a great art school that's right down the street from Brown. So I got to take transfer credits there and um, basically came up with this thesis project that involved interviewing artists and scientists that are um, working in kind of environmental conservation fields. Uh, about the potential for art to inspire coral reef conservation and what would make a really impactful work of art and how do you change people's minds and lifestyle choices to actually affect conservation. So I kind of used all their input and qualitatively did a little bit of analysis and came up with basically this gigantic um, art installation that was my first large scale ceramic sculptural installation that I did called Our Changing Seas. Um, it, it's about, it's still up in Washington, DC. It's about, um, oh, I wanna say like 15 feet tall and about 11 feet wide. It's kind of gigantic and heavy and huge, but it, it depicts the uh, really vibrant, colorful, beautiful forms of coral reef organisms that I find so fascinating. And then shows the transition from colorful and healthy to sickened and bleached. Um, kind of like the work behind me, which is Our Changing Seas 3. Um, I've continued that series over the last 10 years. And um, I think that corals give us a really stark visualization of climate change by bleaching. Um, and climate change otherwise is really hard to understand and visualize. So I think that, that um, the visualization that corals offer is a really powerful tool to kind of communicate that issue. Yes, that's the work that introduced me to you and I mm -hmm. was so moved and blown away by it. I love that you had the idea that you wanted to make a masterpiece and then you did the research, mm -hmm. and did the work. That's, that's amazing. It's like you knew that it existed and you had to get to the point. I, that's, that's really fascinating to hear the process behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so you told me that you feel like you have this endless muse in the ocean. And I would really love to hear more about your studio, uh, studio practice and mm -hmm. the creative process behind your works. Um, could you kind of walk us through how you create these huge um, installations? Mm -hmm. 
I, I do feel like I have an endless muse. I, I often say that nature is more creative than I could ever be. Like anytime I kind of hit a roadblock and don't know what to do different, I can go scuba diving and see creatures that I've never seen before and that um, are so much zanier and more alien looking than things that I would probably come up with on my own. So it's a great inspiration. And that's something that I really want people to kind of feel when they look at my work, because that's what really made me care about protecting coral reefs in the first place. I was just fascinated by the kind of alien forms and appendages um, and the colors. And it's so exciting to me. And that's what made me really fall in love with them and hope to protect them. So I think about that when I'm designing a work. I usually start with a sketch and I draw it by hand, just really simple pen and ink and um, colored pencil. And then once the design is kind of approved or um, finalized, whatever project I'm doing, um, then I'll make a scale version of that on Photoshop and measure everything really meticulously. Uh, my work looks really organic, but it's actually really, really obsessively and meticulously measured and planned out. So I don't start building a single thing until I know exactly where every piece is going to be on the wall in relation to one another and how the hardware is going to work and all that stuff. So once I have that map, I make a full scale version on the floor of my studio where I'm sitting right here in Los Angeles and um, I make kind of paper cutouts for the footprint of each piece and then start building usually from the middle working outwards and my work needs to really install on the wall kind of like a three-dimensional puzzle um, so and as you can imagine it's fragile like um, porcelain and enemy tentacles break easily if they're kind of improperly handled and that's really similar to the delicate bodies of living reef organisms so I think that that um, medium in ceramic is really important to my work for that sense of fragility um, and once I build all the pieces on the giant map on my floor I let them dry and then I have to do a bisque firing and um, then I use a color palette of glazes that I've kind of developed to represent or be similar to different um, natural tones in coral reefs, but then also I use a variety of white glazes for bleached corals and so all my work is glazed. Yeah, the um, and then fired again. are incredible. Um, actually, I have a, a kind of a follow up question to this. Are the forms in your installation, are they representational all of real species or do you sometimes get fanciful? while while creating? I definitely don't try to be completely realistic. I have studied enough coral taxonomy that I could probably uh, do that and create kind of natural history dioramas, but that's not my goal with my work. I really just want to use the inspiration and kind of the ideas that I come up with when I'm scuba diving to um, create hybrid species or just sort of celebrate the particular forms that I find especially exciting to look at, just to kind of evoke that sense of excitement and curiosity and wonder uh, that I feel when I'm diving on a healthy reef. Yeah, I definitely feel that. I've gone scuba diving and snorkeling a lot, and um, you really do capture that feeling of being underneath this alien new world uh, underneath the water. Um, so will you tell me a bit about how you sort of, maybe even on a sort of day-to-day -day basis combine or with projects, combine your role as an artist with your role as a climate active um, advocate? How, does, mm -hmm. how do those two roles come together? Well, these days I work full-time as an artist um, and basically all of my work is, has the goal of inspiring ocean conservation. So I don't take on projects that aren't related to that. I really focus on trying to do a lot of work that ideally is gonna have a public um, facing uh, venue so that I can get the word out and um, get as many eyeballs on it as possible. And I feel like um, it's tough to ship ceramic sculpture around the world. So not a lot of people have seen my work in person, but. Um, the more of that that I can do, the better, because I feel like it's, that's the way that I feel like I can have the strongest voice. Um, but uh, I think doing events like this and kind of interviews and, you know, Earth Day things, I think using art as kind of a fun, exciting way to get people interested and um, kind of uh, sneak in a message of conservation that doesn't feel full of doom and gloom <laughs> can be 
uh, a good way to go at it. So um, I think giving people hope and a sense of excitement is really important. Yes, I completely agree. I actually, um, I, one of my favorite podcasts is Out Outrage and Optimism and Christiana Figueres talks about that a lot, you know, about the mm -hmm. importance of optimism and also that you catch more flies with honey is something she always says. Yeah. And I feel like your um, installations are just pure visual honey. <laughs> People <laughs> like, just have to, I'm sure just, you know, are so attracted and want to come in and then the conversation starts, um, which is so powerful. Um, so something that you said, we had a previous conversation when I invited you to come and talk to me, um, and you said something that really resonated with me, um, that sometimes you feel like you're building monuments to the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I often uh, feel like I'm creating memorials to nature. And mm -hmm. this often feels really heavy, although the imagery itself is so beautiful. Um, and I, I find these tensions in your work as well. Do you, um, sorry, do, do both love and grief uh, play a part in your creative practice? I think so. I mean, I say the same thing. I, I do feel like I'm building monuments to reefs and I hope they're not memorials um, is kind of how I say it, but it's the same idea. And um, obviously grief is the reason I, I do what I do. It's like a sense of heartbreak that I felt really deeply in my soul when I was first falling in love with coral reefs and realizing at the same time how threatened they are. And they, half of the coral reefs on our planet have disappeared in my lifetime and I'm 35 and they could be completely, you know, non-functioning as ecosystems by the end of my life. And so that is really heartbreaking to me, but that's not going to inspire people to save them like that is just so sad <laughs> so you have to look at solutions you have to give people a way to appreciate the beauty and feel for themselves what is so important and valuable about them in order to protect them yeah yeah i agree and, and i do and i do try to my, myself stay away from the grief but i but i do sometimes think that the grief that i feel is really a signal of how much love i have for the natural world and i think also mm -hmm. yours is the love that you have for coral reefs and i think that that love shines through through the work which mm -hmm. is so powerful because i think it's a shared love you know the connection mm -hmm. to the natural world is a pretty um universal experience when people are out Definitely. in nature experiencing it um yeah. So what, what advice, if, if any, do you have to artists and creatives who want to become advocates for a livable earth? I think everyone has to have a personal connection to what they're doing for conservation. So anyone who wants to get involved in conservation has to do some soul searching and figure out what their unique skills and passion are um, and harness those and to do something that can um, change the world, be it with research or communications or art or whatever it is. Um, there are so many different ways to attack this issue and um, everyone's different. So um, I think experiment and um, recognize your skills and then also just don't give up. I think it's really easy to get uh, disillusioned, um, especially trying to make a living as an artist and do something bigger than that in terms of conservation. And I think um, just don't give up. Yeah, that's good advice. <laughs> I think also, you, I, I, Dr. Ayana Johnson posted this really great Venn diagram a couple of days ago, um, where she's, you know, kind of it's sort of an exercise for people to find what role they might play in the climate um, in, you know, in the climate crisis. And the very first uh, circle at the very top is what brings you joy. And um, I think that that I can imagine you and your studio creating your artworks. There's a lot of joy in that, as well as in diving and, and looking at the specimen. So, um, it feels yeah. like joy is a really big part of your practice. Definitely. Um, yeah, and that's so important. Um, and do you have a, any particular maybe call to action where folks can go to get involved in, in ocean conservation that you might want to share with folks that are listening? Um, there are so many great organizations that are doing really important work. I personally work with an organization based in California called Mission Blue, which was founded by an oceanographer named Sylvia Earle, who is 
um, in her 80s now, but has been exploring the ocean for over six decades and um, still goes scuba diving and traveling all the time. And it's she's just such a force of nature. And so um, I recommend watching the film Mission Blue. Um, that's kind of a story of like her career and um, that's a great organization to look up. Um, there's also other documentaries on Netflix that you can watch that um, are kind of about other people that are doing great work in terms of coral conservation, like Chasing Coral is a good one to check out, um, Racing Extinction also, so. Wonderful, thanks so yeah. much. I'm gonna put those into a list and I can share them um, when I share this video. And um, do you have any new, uh, any news or upcoming projects that we should keep on our, on our radar? Um, I have been staying busy, just sort of acting like a coral sitting in my studio, doing lots of projects during COVID. So <laughs> um, I have one work that's um, called Our Changing Seas 7 that is going to be coming out um, hopefully in the next month um, at a resort called the Seabird in Oceanside, California, near San Diego. Um, and uh, a couple other projects in progress, but I'll also have a show at Highfield Hall, Hall and Gardens in Falmouth, Massachusetts this summer. So I'm looking forward to that. Exciting. Um, wonderful. Well, that's, that wraps up my questions. And I was gonna pass it over to Lorena to see um, if there are some questions that she'd like to ask you on behalf of the audience. Great. Lorena. Hi, everyone. Hi, Courtney, thank you so much for that incredible, um, not only personal insight, but also sharing uh, your work. It's very inspiring and happens to match really beautifully with Claire's today, which is kind of impressive. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. First, um, a couple of people ask about clarification on where your work is displayed in BC. Oh, right. I didn't really mention that. Um, so that uh, Our Changing Seas 1 uh, debuted at the Commerce Department, but now it's installed in the lobby of the uh, AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which publishes Science Magazine. So that's at 12th and H Street downtown in DC. I'm not sure if they're open to the public these days, but they might be. Fantastic, thank you. And the other question uh, relevant to some of the conversation that we were having earlier on what kind of advice you'd provide is how do you practice self-care um, combining these two passions? That's really important, especially sculpting. It can be really rough on your body. And um, I had to do physical therapy for a while after my big project for the US Embassy in Jakarta because that was so huge and I was spending like 11 hours a day sculpting. So, <laughs> um, but in addition to that, I think just um, taking breaks and um, kind of be like, my work is very therapeutic. So mentally, I think it kind of recharges me. So that's not usually an issue, but I sometimes do listen to way too much news in my studio. So <laughs> turning off the news is always a good idea. If it gets too much, look up some podcasts. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. And I think that is really wise and sort of alludes to what um, Claire shared about Dr. Ayanna Johnson saying, sharing, finding that space in which your work keeps you motivated and it's not just, you know, exhausting and draining, but it's actually something that provides you with energy that you can share with the world is super important. Um, mm -hmm. We have another question right here on the chat. <laughs> um, Mimsy asks, do you earn enough money making art and to keep body and soul together? <laughs> um, it's definitely a struggle making a living as an artist, but I've been pretty fortunate the last five years or so. Um, I've had a pretty steady stream of commissions coming in. So, so far so good and I'll take it as long as I can. So <laughs> I'm just going to keep riding this wave. It's all good. <laughs> That's excellent. And I think that's why these kinds of opportunities in which you can share your work, but not just, you know, the aesthetics of it, but the reason behind it are so important. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully this will continue to create that community of like-minded um, artists and art supporters to uh, make sure that's still the reality. We, we need the arts, if anything, uh, we've learned in the last year. So thank you again for sharing. Definitely. Thanks. Yeah, was, are there any more questions or? I don't, I don't think so. Um, 
So Courtney, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really honored. And um, again, I'm just a huge admirer of your work and your mission. And um, you really are making a difference with your work. Uh, I can say as a long time follower and lover of coral reefs, it was, I, I had never seen it translated into the arts until I saw your work. And it was something that I, um, that I found really deeply moving and really connected to. And I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that. So really thank you so much for the work that you do. Oh, that means a lot to me. I'm so glad that my work resonates with you and I love what you're doing also. And so it's just really fun to know kind of that there's this community out there. I spend so much time alone in my studio. So it's really fun to connect with you and just really kind of know that there are other people out there that have similar motivations and, um, I love what you're doing. So I'm excited to see what you do next. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Thank you. We'll stay in touch. And yeah. Yeah. thank you again. And thank you everyone that I can't see for joining us. Um, and we'll be back again next week with a science discussion about soil. <laughs> and uh, which doesn't sound exciting, but it will be exciting because soil is amazing. So you'll find out <laughs> all about it next week. Thank you so much, Courtney. Thank you, Lorena, as well. Thank you both. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.